It's been a few days without baseball, but today was a fun one. Two wins in two games by the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, a nail-biter and a blowout. We also have a ton of roster moves. Uh, a COVID situation occurring. All on today's episode of Locked On Guardians. <laughs> You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Nice little gap there. I apologize. Uh, I want to thank everyone who watched yesterday's show. I was so tired, I forgot to do Wednesday wrap-up. I realized that uh, this morning as I was kind of digging through my numbers. I mean, what's happening right now is is so fascinating to me in college baseball. Uh, I've had so many tweets today that I I wouldn't necessarily be able to go dig them all out. But, you know, uh, I got into, we'll do a quick little one at the top of the show before we talk about it, that, uh, you know, this college catcher class... (laughs) just keeps getting better and better uh you know we talked about the big three and then uh, the big four with um, metzinger we've been down the board brandon tinsman at wake now wake you know i i, I sent out a retweet recently uh to my draft piece back when i was at scout that doesn't exist anymore where i was talking about like my number the players that i am higher on than the board were trevor stefan and Stuart fairchild Farrell Child was an awake outfielder, Stefan, a starting pitcher from Arkansas at the time. And I think I learned a lot over the years about Wake and the band box that they play in. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's always that thing. But Tinsman was stuck behind Shane Munts, who had a really good cape, and then the COVID season happened, and everything kind of got into a disaster. I had Munts in my way too early mock as a potential first rounder coming off that cape. Uh, so he didn't really get an opportunity to play. And right now, I mean, he's just getting on base and hitting for power. I think he's, like, right there with Metzinger um, for home runs. So an interesting name in that regard. Never really got an opportunity. He was an infielder, outfielder, and catcher in high school. And then Matt Wood, just a down-the-line the, the line name to know if you're looking for a guy who is a – Guardians, like, they're co- – you know, if you're you're looking for someone cut from the Logan Ice mold. Now, don't view that in the negative light of what Logan Ice ended up, you know, not co- working together. But – Cold weather, left-handed, good contact rates. That's Matt Wood at Pennsylvania right now, or Pennsylvania, at Penn State. There's also a catcher at, at Penn, um, Appel. I can't think of his first name. Appel, who who is hitting for high average, I want to say. So there, it's a fun catcher class. Um, the Guardians really should probably draft two. Uh, I'm all for them at this point in time, going with that first-round pick if one of the big three catchers is left, and then coming back and getting another one because there is not a lot, and, uh, man— you know, everyone's talking about wanting to acquire a catcher, and I'll just put this out there again. We talked about it about a month ago on the show. The catcher that makes the most sense for the Cleveland Guardians there to try to acquire one is Austin Nola. If San Diego decides to go with Campesino, or if they go out and trade for someone, Nola doesn't have a spot. He's had issues with health, but he has a very low swinging strike percentage. Uh, he is someone who makes fantastic contact. He has good framing data. And, you know, those are kind of the two important things. He's a contact-based, and he's got five years of team control, four years of team control now. Uh, But either way, those are just some catcher thoughts and some of the Wednesday wrap-up that I missed earlier uh, due to me recording while just purely exhausted. Uh, Let's talk about these games, though. Let's get into the fun of it. So, actually, before we do that, let's talk about the roster moves. So, you know, I originally tweeted out, because we all kind of knew this morning it had broken early that Gabriel Arias... Arias would be the uh, the call up, and he played in both games today. Uh, I assume he'll get sent back down afterwards. It's nothing's official yet. And with that, I had actually forgotten Austin Hedges. Like I had talked about that, you know, at that point in time, you had Quantrell, Naylor, um, Miller, Arias, and um, all on the the forty man ro- or all on roster, which is fourteen percent. I had blocked out that Austin Hedges was on the roster. So when you add in, in uh, Hedges, if all of them have been on the roster at the same time, they'd have been 70%, 17%, whew, mind going quicker in my mouth, 17% of the roster from the Clevenger trade. That's kind of crazy to think about. Uh, then we saw the COVID situation with Quantrell and Miller, along with Anthony Castro going on. And when it wasn't announced what was happening, at first it was like, wait, they're adding Eniel De Los Santos and Kurt McCarty. Now, we talked about McCarty this week. 
um, as kind of a down the line guy and Tanner Tully. And I was like, Wait, they're at it. Who are they going to take off? Who are the cuts going to be? How are they going to make this work? Well, COVID happened. You know, this is a, the, the, they had a bunch of breakouts, you know, and we don't know who had COVID and who's an exposure case. We also know it's, you know, you have to get PCR testing. It's technically 10 days, but if you can have, I believe like two negative tests, you can come back like Brandon Nimmo, I think came back after five days to the Mets. So we're going to have to kind of wait and see. Um, I don't know if we even know for sure as of recording uh, who's going to start tomorrow's game. I was really hoping, you know, as we see these set of moves, like Eniel, uh, he looked really good, but he's been in the big leagues before, and I think he'll get opportunities. Uh, McCarty, I, all he does is perform well, and I believe he was teammates with Sandlin at Southern Miss, uh, but he just keeps, you know, he's a lefty who just keeps performing well, and if we still had Lugies, I mean, I think he could be fast-tracked as that. I don't have any doubt in my mind. Tanner Tully, though, is the interesting thing here. I was sad he did not, that Hench's pitched at the end of game one. Um, I'm hoping this means that Tully is scheduled to get into uh, tomorrow's game, that maybe we'll see. Now, McCarty would be, I think, he last pitched. I was talking with Justin Lada of Indians Space One Cider. Uh, I see I DM about a lot of this stuff as we're, like, trying to remember things. Uh, or mo- more, if I'm being honest, it's like, hey, Justin, <laughs> help me out. When did this guy last pitch? So it's more like me bothering him. But we have fun with it. At least I think uh, Justin is enjoying it, uh, you know. And technically, you know, neither of these pitchers line up to pitch tomorrow, but someone's got to pitch tomorrow. So I think they're probably setting all of this up to have kind of a bullpen by committee where maybe McCarty goes three, Tully goes three, uh, something along those lines. But I want to talk about Tanner Tully. Now, originally I'm like, is he the, the first Ohio State player since Scott Lewis? He's the first Ohio State pitcher since Scott Lewis. Uh, I also blanked out on Dick Swisher today. But Tanner Tully was a 2016 draft pick, a 26th rounder. The most war of any Indians 26th round pick is Mike Devereaux, who didn't sign. Uh, Jeff Newman, a catcher, uh, is the highest that signed. And then Kyle Denny, who is more well-known, I believe, for being shot on the team bus while wearing a cheerleading outfit. Wasn't that what happened? And he had, like, high boots, and it helped stop. Like, it's a really weird story. He wasn't, I mean... 26 round pick uh, coming up and making the big leagues is not common. So I really want to see Tully get in the game. And like we've talked about him on this show, not as a prospect. Uh, he doesn't miss enough bats, but the dude just works. And he's like, if they need to, someone to do a spot start, it's Tanner Tully for the past few years. If they need someone to fill in somewhere, it's Tanner Tully. Whenever you see like, oh, they had a pitching event somewhere with kids. Tanner Tully is there. Like, He's going to be, I guarantee, like in 10 years, he's still going to be in this organization unless he's gotten a job with another one. I think I think coaching is very much coming up for him. Uh, and then, you know, I tweeted about him today and anything that came back was positive. Like everyone loves him as a person, which is nice to see. So, you know, again, I, this was COVID is never a good thing. Uh, but in this case, I think it might have inadvertently caused a wonderful thing. Again, I'm not, you know, I want to, I want to be respectful of all those who have had, I mean, I've had people have lost to COVID. Um, it, it's a terrible, awful disease. Full stop. What this weird situation allowed for the Cleveland Guardians, though, is because of when a player goes on the COVID list, you can call a player up to your roster and not have to put them on the 40 man. The Guardians could add three players because they lost three players. They went out and added Tanner Tully, who may not have ever really gotten an opportunity in the big leagues he should pitch. Um, he's now been on the 40 man or, you know, he's now been on the active roster that changes his earnings for life. He gets to be paid at a higher rate for the rest of his life, significantly higher. Yes. He got a hundred thousand dollars out of college. He got a, a decent bonus. That is for someone who has spent, you know, he's drafted in 2016 and has made less than minimum wage as a minor league pitcher. A hundred thousand dollars doesn't go that far. Now that we're talking about six years later. This changes his life forever. And, I mean, the chance to pitch in the big leagues, even if it's a cup of coffee, is something almost nobody gets. So I am really, really pulling for him to get out there. I'm hoping we'll see him on Thursday. He has done everything right. He has worked his tail off. He has done all the grunt work, all the dirty work. You know, he's an excellent control guy. Uh, the Guardians find an extra gear for almost everyone. We talked about that fan graphs list yesterday. Talked about, like, Trent Denholm. And um, Sharp, the Clemson pitcher, was a two-way guy. Uh, 
you know, in the jumps they've made, they didn't find that extra gear with Tanner Tully. But what they did find was an incredibly reliable person and an incredibly reliable pitcher who has done everything they've asked every step of the way. And he deserves this opportunity. And it's going to be a life changer in terms of his earnings. It's going to be a life changer just in terms of being with the team. So I don't know if this would happen otherwise, especially not with the Guardians and their 40-man situation. Like Tanner Tully was never going to be in line to make this 40-man. Uh, Iniel De Los Santos was going to be very hard. And uh, Kurt McCarthy, McCarthy, McCarty, let's get it right. Uh, was also going to be very hard. So this, I appreciate that when they had a chance to call up players, uh, they didn't go out and necessarily add the obvious ones. They went out and knew this is probably going to be a short-term thing. And again, uh, this isn't to say that those players don't deserve to be in the big leagues. They are just fringe. They're not definitive major leaguers. There are all sorts of players who get cups of coffee. This is a well-earned opportunity for those players. And I am, I'm ecstatic for them. I I really honestly am. Uh, I think this is a wonderful thing they did because again if you're going to just call up your best pitchers you call up you know uh someone like joey cantillo you call up someone you know that that grouping uh kind of the more interesting ones you maybe call up a logan well maybe you don't want to start the clock on logan allen so there's also that there is some of that but i do think this was also a bit of a reward for people who have done everything right in the indians guardians still do it organization I'm going to take a break, come back, talk about game one, game two. And, uh, you know, it is the humor that talked about how I thought the Guardians might be a slightly better team than the Giants, uh, and they get swept by the Giants. And I talk about how the White Sox just have them dominated, and they sweep the doubleheader today. And our first sponsor today are our good friends over at BlueNile.com. Now, I've talked about Blue Nile on the show yesterday. Uh, it is a, you know, they have a very interesting... Uh, very, you know, it's not a cookie cutter jewelry. This is a, you know, a, a jewelry company that makes interesting designs, has interesting people there. And right now, you know, they are putting together a special deal for uh, people, locked on listeners. This Mother's Day, give mom something to treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Sports. Uh, listeners get five dollars off 500 this podcast exclusive is only good through mother's day so use the code locked on that's code locked on plus every order is insured ships free and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside shop stress-free and find your favorite piece your favorite forever piece go to blue today okay let's talk game one let me close some tabs here. So I, I'm. What are you? Are you a person who has a million tabs? I can't. I can't take it. I get anxious when I got more than five uh, going. So, you know, I tweeted out as I was because uh, the first inning happened on my lunch break. No, on my planning. So I was able to. I'm sitting there with my phone, discreetly watching it while I'm uh, getting together some lesson plans. Uh, and <laughs> the first inning is just. It's it's an odd inning to watch. Like that was my first takeaway. I'm like, man, that first inning is weird. So if you missed it, I just want to pull up the exact fielding error by Tim Anderson, fielding error by Jake Berger, fly out, walk, ground out, and then uh, a single where Ahmed Rosario gets hit by the batted ball and is out unassisted. So if you're if you're tracking at home, error, error, out, walk, ground out, they actually get a hit and it turns into an out. So they got to run by doing almost nothing. I was like, okay. I was like, this is this is bad. You got to take advantage of things. Uh, when you were the Guardians, you're facing a team. You get to the top of the second inning. It starts with another error. Tim Anderson had three errors in this one. And after that, it just it's a hit parade. The Guardians will go on to let's see. I believe they get nine, ten runs across. They get nine runs total in that inning before they get into an out. Of course, Austin Hedges hits promptly into a double play, and then Miles Straw grounds out. They got nine across. They batted around more, you know, it was, they started with, uh, with Arias and he got the, you know, they got all the way back to him. And then you still had three more batters. It was at what, uh, four, 13 pers- people came to the plate in that one. And from there it was pretty much, you know, lock, uh, locked up. I mean, there was the rest of the game went, uh, very well. There wasn't a whole lot to do. Uh, the the big note being Jose Ramirez hitting another grand slam in that inning. 
He is the first. It was a club record for, I believe, like Grand Slams in April with him having two. Uh, it was, I, like I said, that, they just put him away there. And then for all the, the hemming and hawing, I mean, this is still a very good lineup. Bieber went six innings, one run, seven strikeouts, four hits, zero walks. He had another strong performance. Brian Shaw came in and was fine. And Neil De Los Santos looked better than Shaw. Henches had a, a good inning. He's working in this role. Maybe it'll work for him. You know, I have not been his biggest supporter. That is a well-known fact. Maybe it's going to f- work out. Uh, he's big, he's left-handed, and he definitely can throw hard. So maybe this is the, the ideal role. Who reached base twice in this one? Uh, it's almost one of those where you're like, they scored a lot of runs. Wouldn't that be almost everyone? But it's, it's not. They only had three walks. So, and Mercado is the only, or Mercado and Naylor are the only people with multi-hit games. So it's Mercado, Naylor, Rosario, Reyes, uh, and then Straw. That's it in terms of the multi-hitters. Uh, you know, a, 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 I know I butcher his name all the time, so I'm trying to say it right. right. Gabriel. Made his debut at second base, which is just odd because he's got the strongest arm on the team. This insistence on playing Rosario at shortstop, it's, you're hurting your squad. <laughs> like, why? Why, why, why? Why would you do it? What? it? Because he played there last year. He is your worst shortstop option. When you have the players up they have right now, he is the fourth best shortstop on this team. He's the fourth best shortstop behind Clement, behind Jimenez, and behind uh, Gabriel Arias. Fourth best shortstop, and he's playing there every day. That's my my little vent here. Uh, players of the game. Well, one of them is going to be R- uh, Ramirez for the Grand Slam. You know, that, that makes it pretty easy. It's interesting after that. It's like they didn't have any other extra base hits. They just sat there and uh, whittled them away across. I have to give one to Bieber. You go six innings, give up one run, and only four base hits. That's That's a strong performance. So it comes down to, you know, essentially... Uh, Naylor or Mercado, and I'm going to lean towards Naylor overall uh, in this situation because of, you know, everything he's gone through. He gets the third star for me in this one. Uh, Clement did get some thoughts, uh, but he only had the one hit. He also had the outfield assist. Uh, they were 9 for 14 with runners in, scoring to, um, runners in scoring position. I almost said scoring condition. Let's do the thing where we add it up. So the, the Indians had 11 hits and four errors on the White Sox. has 15 opportunities. Three more walks. It gives them 18 opportunities. There was a wild pitch as well for Keiko, but I don't really count those. I just mentioned them. On 18 opportunities, I got 11 runs. That's really good. That is a really high percentage. That's an unusually high percentage. Often, like I said, we'd see about five to six runs. This was a game they were very efficient. You know, they had the one inning, and they just went, went, went. Uh, the other side of things, the White Sox only had one walk, and that is a problem for this team. The White Sox as a team do not walk. Uh, they are line drive city, and... That's going to lead to a lot of um, streaky play and some ups and downs in terms of performance. Five hits, one walk, six opportunities, one on six. That's not good. That's, you know, the opposite of good. Uh, So the Guardians win this one rather handily. It was pretty much over after the second inning. Strong performances all around. Um, I mean, Steve Kwan even, what, got a pinch hit uh, to knock in the 11th run in the eighth inning. We saw a a lot of players get opportunities. I mean, Hedges got a hit. Do you really need more than that? Uh, it, it was it was a really... In a, I mean, all in all, maybe it wasn't that interesting of a game. Once you got past the second inning, it was kind of a bit of a draw, uh, of a you know, a game where n- not as much happened. But those first two innings were definitely the time to, uh, to jump in, watch, and enjoy the Guardians just dominating the White Sox. Now, I said that was the game they're most likely to win from the top. Let's take our next commercial break, come back, and discuss... A game that had me nervous pretty much the whole time. Our sponsor today is Bet Online. Now, I've talked about I am not the most uh, knowledgeable person when it comes to sports betting. So I finally did the research after kicking myself for so long where I was like, let's, I should have put money on Steve Kwan. I was like, what would 20 bucks have gotten me? If I had been smart and put my 20 bucks on Steve Kwan before the season began, I now know that plus 5,000 means that if I bet 100, I'd get 5,000. So if I'm betting 20, which is a quarter of that, I would get a quarter of a thousand, which, uh, you know, so what, 10 would give you instead of 5,500, so a grand. 
potentially cost myself a grand by not going to betonline.net, your number one source for all betting stats and sports info. Find all of the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, where the game starts. Game number two. A 2-1 to one win by the Guardians. Very close. I talked about I like Jimmy Lambert. He had an okay game. Not a great one. The bullpen, which I talked about really liking for the White Sox, was the name here. And then the Guardian side of things, the bullpen uh, held up incredibly well, too. One thing that stood out, well, a few things that stood out in this one. One, you know, Lavastita still doesn't have that first hit. The fact that he laid off, like, some, some really, you know, hard pitches, had the recognition to not press and had a pair of walks. He reached base twice in this one. Uh, and in terms of people who reached base twice, it was him and Jose Ramirez. They had three walks, two of them to La Vestita. You know, they only had six hits. It, that was big, him being able to do that. And I uh, just want to give credit. That is a young kid who isn't ready, who's being forced into a role because somebody is hurting because they have no flexibility on their 40 man. And for him to sit back and be able to do that is it's, it's a positive sign. Uh, Gabriel Arias also had his first hit in this one in terms of just things to mark down, things to see. Uh, Stephen Kwan had the rare strikeout. He also uh, scored one of the runs in this one, as did Arias after his. And, I mean, that that's what held up. You had Kwan had a double. Mercado had a double, I believe, and Jose Ramirez had a double. Mercado, I want to say, drove in uh, Arias, and uh, Jose drove in Kwan, if I'm, if I'm right in this. So they got a run in the first. They got a run in the fourth. The White Sox got one in the fifth, and that was it. This was a low-scoring affair. McKenzie was untouchable. He didn't give up a hit. It was a little bit, again, you know, a bit of an odd inning when you, you go to the fifth because he had a no-hitter going into the fifth inning, and what does he do? Walk, walk, double. All of a sudden, you have runners, uh, and it was could have been tied, right? Because on that double... Uh, it goes to Stephen Kwan. Uh, Reese McGuire, the backup catcher, scores. Adam Ingle, who's got legs, who's a fast guy, trying to score from first, gets thrown out. And, I mean, that's the game saver. Like Stephen Kwan, and people doubt his arm. It's like, I think he can handle left field or right field. The arm looked plenty fine in this one. But, yeah, he's you know he's going to be one of the players of the game. With that throw and with having a run scoring uh, scoring a run and having an extra base hit, yeah, Stephen Kwan is a player of the game. We can just state that outright. McKenzie, it's just it's the control. It's the one thing that worries you. He only gave up one hit in four and a third innings, but he had four uh, walks and he hit a batter. So he had six base runners in four and a third innings. He ran out of gas late. He's just got to be able to sustain more. And then also just he also had a wild pitch in this one. When things go poorly for him is when control isn't there. That's just what happens when the control, which is interesting because that was not his, the control issues didn't come until after the health issues in double A back in like 2019 when he missed the first season with our first month of the season with back issues. Since then we've seen it kind of come and go. And that was his big issue last year before he got sent down again. I mean, we saw why I said that in terms of talent, he could easily be the number two on this team in terms of refinement. He's still just kind of in that grouping, you know, go ahead and pick one. Uh, which is basically everyone other than a healthy Bieber. So, but it, it was strong performance by him. Uh, Anthony Ghost comes into a, you know, a tricky situation with uh, the double. You still have the tying run at second with one out. He ends up going one and two thirds innings, strikes out four of the five batters. Uh, he or the four of his five outs come by the strikeout. Uh, Nick Sandlin has had a rough go, but this was a nice seventh. Came in, did what he needed to do, one hit, one walk. Trevor Steffen is quietly turning into their eighth inning guy. He is moving into the role that was Karen Chalk or Corinne Chalks. And Corinne Chalk has not been healthy. He hasn't pitched. And there's he really didn't pitch at all last year after uh, all the issues with the sticky stuff. So if, man, if they could get him even to 80, because before sticky stuff got taken away from him, he was one of the top 10 relievers in baseball. He was just phenomenal. If you can get 80% of that, that's still above average. And all of a sudden, if Trevor Steffen can keep doing what he's doing now, he's a full year in the system, and the numbers are just nasty. And he looks really good in that role. And I spent about, you know, a good 10 minutes tweeting out all of my 2017 draft takes where I was just 
this is the guy. This is my college pitcher. It's like I really liked Blaine Knight the year before at Arkansas. He was doing, you know, a lot of things the Guardians typically like. He ended up going to Baltimore. He was a draft-eligible sophomore who went back to school, and that's always kind of a bit of a red flag. But the more – so, I mean, I was I, – Blaine, Blaine Knight had started out my guy the year before, and then I had faded a little as the year went on because he's more of a two-pitch guy. Uh, but I was checking in the next year on him, and it was Stephanie who just kept catching my eye, catching my eye, fastball slider, uh, and just performance-wise. And then he goes to a place that is not good for pitcher development. He comes to the Guardians – this this could be a special get. We've ta- if you go back, I mean, I guess you don't have to. The Guardians have essentially gotten nothing out of the Rule Five. They've lost a ton of talent to the Rule Five, but for whatever reason, have never gotten a regular out of it. Trevor Steffen might already be the greatest Rule Five pick in franchise history. Like, it's not hard for him to have accomplished that after just the first year of being a okayish relief arm. If he turns himself into an eighth inning, a back end type. It's, he's easily the greatest Rule 5 selection in the entire history of the Cleveland Guardians. It's just not something they've done pretty well with in general, but still, they've lost you know, Santander, Hector Rondon, uh, Willie Tavares. Like These are names that just come to mind quickly. Now, Tavares, they ended up doing a trade for later um, to when he was going to be offered back. And there's there's been others uh, as well. Those are just quick uh, names that come to mind. It, it's not been a good thing for the Guardians uh, but Stefan I mean he looked great in this game uh, who reached base twice I, I think I already said it. it's Jose and Smir- um, and it's Lavastida who are three stars yeah McKenzie got himself into some trouble but he was also just amazing in this one Quan double you know run and save the game with his throw uh, it, then it it comes down to you know do you go with with Jose, I, I'm more tempted to go with Stefan or Class A. Like, I didn't actually get to see Class A pitch. Um, this game ended right at bedtime for my daughter. So I was going to cut an orange because the kid had already eaten two of them. And uh, she's uh, going to eat me out of home with her, her love of fruit. Uh, and I came back in and the inning was done. Like, I, he was so efficient and so quick. I didn't get to see Class A actually pitch uh, in that one. Uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you're going to give it to someone, you have to give it to Ghosts. It, what he did in the inning and two thirds, coming in with a runner on second base, not letting that runner get across, uh, five outs, four via strikeout, no base runners. He's the third star in this one. You know, special. You know, the entire pen gets a little bit of a tip of your cap. Uh, Gabriel Arias for the first hit, Lavastida for the patience. Who, I mean, he's still waiting on his first hit. A lot of good performances in this one. Uh, again, it's we don't know who is going to necessarily be pitching on Thursday, but this was fun. I, I kept waiting for you know the other shoe to drop. I'm sorry, tomorrow's game is Plesak, so we do know who's pitching tomorrow. Uh, Plesak versus C, C, uh, Dylan Cease. Yeah, that was always on the table. I guess it was Friday's game is the to be determined, as is interesting. Friday and Saturday are to be determined. Sunday is Aaron Savale, so we'll see. But, uh, yeah, tomorrow's sack, and then who knows? But to face the White Sox, to get two wins, to ride a, a, a tight affair and pull off that second win, it's still a lot of fun to watch this team. And RBIs are a terrible stat. Sorry, Hiram. I know you're out there disagreeing with me if you're listening. We've gotten into this many times. RBIs are a terrible stat for evaluating a player. What they're a very good stat for is letting you know about lineups lineup construction and lineup opportunities because rbis are just compiling if you hit the same hitter hits ninth or third there's going to be a significant difference in their number of rbis so it's not about player performance it's equally about who is in front of them and what we're seeing with jose ramirez who i believe is they said up to 20 rbis already uh in just 11 games (laughs) you know he's on pace for over 300 rbis i think i saw the guardian tweet out today it shows just how different the top of this lineup is now. I mean, Straw, I keep thinking he's going to regress and be like a tick below average, but maybe he's not. Maybe he's finally got an opportunity. He's finally comfortable. He's, you know, there's comfort means a lot in life. I think, you know, I talked about yesterday how flexibility is one of those things that I think we don't appreciate enough when it comes to athletes. I think comfort is as well. Like we have all been there, right? We've all had, we think, you know, it's baseball. They're playing a game. If when you're comfortable and you are more relaxed, you do better at all things. 
And if you think you're going to do well, you will do well. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Straw is going to end up being uh, a slightly above average bat. And if he is that, that contract they signed him to is a steal on the level of Jose Ramirez, his first contract nearly, because center field is so hard to find. Every team, half of, you know, it's three hardest positions in baseball to find. Catcher, shortstop, center field. And I would almost be tempted to put center. Man, I cannot find the center of this camera here today. I would almost be tempted to put center field ahead of shortstop. Like, I feel like there's more good shortstops than center fielders. It might actually go catcher, center field, shortstop. So, you know, he keeps setting the table. Stephen Kwan, yeah, he's not the red-hot greatest debut of all time anymore, but he's still been a darn good player. Uh, when Owen Miller was there, he's performing well. And eventually we'll start seeing more of these young players. You know, I firmly believe that Nolan Jones is going to get an opportunity and perform well. I firmly believe George Valera is going to be, in terms of the Guardians, a generational outfield prospect. Now, in terms of a generational outfield prospect, it has literally been a generation since this team has drafted, developed, and kept an outfielder, or signed, developed, and kept an outfielder who has been... I Tyler Naquin is the best outfielder this team has produced who actually played for them. Because, again, the top two performers by war, Ryan Church, who was traded... In one of the bad deals to Montreal, um, it was either I don't think it was the Milton Bradley deal, but it might have been the Milton Bradley deal, uh, or and then the other one's Luke Scott, who went to Baltimore for like nothing. Like he was just an afterthought. Uh, so it, I mean, Nick Wynn is your third best outfielder in the last since since Manny Ramirez that this team has drafted and developed. So I mean, right now Stephen Kwan is on pace to be a generational outfielder for this team, uh, and that's just if he's just a shade above league average. So it's but for a team that for so long has run below league average, it's a big step up. And we're seeing that just in terms of guys getting on base in front of Jose. You have Fran Mill who's looked, I, I was screaming all off season for an extension for him. I still believe in an extension for Fran Mill, but he has looked terrible. <laughs> and they're still playing really well, putting up a lot of runs with their cleanup hitter, looking like he should be in triple A because of how much more balanced the lineup is. Uh, and just actually having guys who can perform. Yeah, catcher is still a mess. Yeah, first base still leaves some things to be desired. You know, we got to see if Naylor is a different guy, like that his stance is more open this year as opposed to last year. Uh, has some additional work been done? Has he worked with Vileka? Is it just internal things he's working on? I mean, his brother Bo is, we talked about, he's playing a lot better. Like he was. I took him out of my top 10 prospects. He's looked um, exceptionally better this year as well. So uh, coaching matters. Uh, that's why they made a change at hitting coach uh, in this system. I've been Jeff Ellis. This has been Locked on Guardians podcast. Going long, as always. Remember to rate and review, download daily. It helps the show grow. I want to thank you for making Locked on Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever it is you get podcasts. I don't think I introduced me at the start. I've been the host of this podcast for nearly seven. We'll hit 700 episodes next week. I do want to give a bit of a COA here at the end. I don't even know if that's the right terminology. I'm uh, I'm actually going to be in Cleveland this weekend. Of course, the Guardians will not be. Uh, I've One of my high school buddies is getting married. I am in the wedding. It is up at the Natural History Museum. At least the reception part is. So I no podcast Monday. Maybe no on Tuesday. I am driving there, driving back, using all of my personal days. So if there are no podcasts, um, I'm sorry. That's why. I might try and do a draft one uh, to bank it, but it's also, I mean, I, I, I'm taking the kids with me and the wife, of course, but, you know, as a whole family, we're going. So I got to get everything packed up, put together, uh, and, and hopefully, like, Men's Warehouse will not, like, snub me when I go in tomorrow like they did today so I can actually pick up the tucks that I need to get. Um, you know, shout out to Men's Warehouse for being crappy. I, I appreciate the help when, <laughs> when there's so much other things going on to completely ignore me when I enter your store. Uh, hey, you know, I got a platform, might as well use it. I've been Jeff Ellis. This has been Locked on Guardians podcast for this week. Uh, again, thank you to all the fantastic fans. Top 10 YouTube shows uh, for the MLB on the network. Now, a big part of that was the Stephen Kwan episode that got 700 downloads. I believe that was more than any other show uh, on YouTube combined. So we may not break the top 10 next week unless the numbers pick up, but I want to thank everyone. Uh, Shroom Media, thank you. I appreciate your daily comments uh, and interactions. If I'm too exhausted to sometimes respond, uh, I hope you'll forgive me for being a day late. And I want to thank everyone else who comments, watches, 
and does all that uh, over there. Again, I've been Jeff Ellis, and I want to thank everyone for everything they do to make the Locked On Pod- Guardians podcast everything that it is. As I end every show now, go, go, Guardians, go.